Hi, today we're going to start chapter one of our textbook, which deals with inductive and deductive reasoning. So today we're focusing on making conjectures utilizing inductive reasoning. So first we'll go through some definitions. A conjecture is a testable expression that is based on available evidence, but is not yet proved or proven. So with this, we essentially look at some patterns and try to find how that pattern would continue on and predict it. And we can then test it later on to see if it's true. Whatever well, definition is inductive reasoning. So this is a reasoning that we're using to come up with our conjecture. So we're looking at patterns, identifying properties in those patterns and utilizing that to come up with a prediction about what's going to happen later on in that pattern or in the future. So at this example, we have a statement that has a conjecture about the following pattern. Essentially, we have three figures. And but conjecture is, I think figure eight will have 64 squares. Now it's referring to the small squares inside it. And we want to figure out how they arrived at this conjecture. So we've got this figure, we have this figure, we have this figure, and the, saying by the time we get to figure eight, it's going to have 64 be small squares in it. So one thing that can be helpful for solving these is putting data in tables. So in the first figure, we only had one small square. In the second figure, we had four small squares. In the third figure, we had nine. Now, to figure out more of these, we'll have to draw out more figures and see if we can find a pattern. So four figure, if we follow the pattern that's going on, would look like this. If we add up all these squares, that's going to give us 16 squares. Now, this would technically be the next figure in the sequence. So this is figure five. So if we add up all these, that gives us 25 squares. So we only know what numeric pattern is in the table. So if we actually look at the figure number and compare it to our number of squares, what we can see is our figure number squared gives us how many squares. So now we can test to see if their prediction was correct. So they said the eight figure would have 64 squares. So eight squared is 64. So their prediction should be correct. Next, we have make a conjecture about the product of two odd integers. Now, in this case, we're not given any evidence, but we can come up with our own evidence. So I'm just going to choose two odd numbers and multiply them together. So let's say five and three. So that's going to give me 15. Maybe another couple odd numbers. So seven times nine. That gives me 63. I might try pulling some negatives in here. So if I had say negative five times positive nine, that gives me negative 45. Or if I have two negatives, so let's say negative one, 
times negative seven, that gives me seven. So looking at the pattern here, I notice that everything is an odd number. So the conjecture I can make about the product of two odd integers is it will give us an odd answer. Okay, next example, make a conjecture about the difference between two consecutive perfect squares. So if this requires some knowledge about our language associated with mathematics. So difference we know is subtraction. And then if we have two consecutive perfect squares, that's two perfect squares in a row. So we're going to subtract one perfect square from another. So for example, if I have two squared minus one squared, that's going to give me three. That's one three squared minus two squared gives me five. If I have four squared minus three squared, that gives me seven. If I have five squared minus four squared, that gives me nine. Now, one pattern that I can see emerging is essentially the number that we get here is equal to addition of our base numbers. So I can say, the difference is equal to the sum of the bases. Okay, so we'll just look at one more definition, which is validity. So how accurate a conjecture is. Typically, the more examples that we do that work out, the more accurate we know it is. That being said, if a single example doesn't work, it is no longer valid. Now, sometimes when checking for validity, we might have something that makes it no longer valid. So we could change up our conjecture so that still works. So for example, we might have a situation where the values we're putting in don't work if they're negative, in which case we can con change our conjecture so that what we expect to happen only occurs if it is a positive value. 